if you're there to 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 record the this session for me please as well perfect so i will share the screen with my slides and i hope you can now see my slides well so first of all uh, thank you thank thank you very much for for the invitation and, and for giving me the the, the opportunity also to uh, 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 to, to, to present our, our work in here. So I will talk about um, work that is done in the context of, uh, of an EU funded research project uh, called uh, Examote. And uh, what we work on A, combining visual information with semantics, what we're trying to make data uh, accessible and what we're trying to, on the other hand, to limit the amount of strong labels that we need. I mean, we're working in the medical field and i mean the picture i put up here is maybe a bit of a creepy picture but uh, it shows us in front of a histopathology uh, image so we're directly fighting cancer cells in uh, 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 in, uh, in, in, in 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 this one where we have also marked like some of the regions that are that are linked here and um, i will talk a little bit more also about the images and also about our backgrounds so i have a few more words about myself because i think it explains a little bit of how we arrived into this topic. Uh, I, I myself, I studied medical informatics and worked a bit in industry, then did a PhD in computer vision at the University of Geneva. Uh, and after that, I started, like actually during my PhD, I started to work in the university hospitals in Geneva, where I still have a position in, in the medical faculty. So I'm teaching a little bit uh, there as well. So in, in radiology and, and medical informatics. And at the same time, uh, I've been a professor here at the HESSO Valais in, in Sierre since 2007, so over, over 10 years now. And, um, and while I've moved, I've, I've worked with, uh, I'm, we have a lot of international collaborations, not only in this EU project that I will we'll talk about, but uh, also with, uh, with many other institutions in the US and in, in several European countries. Um, first, like usually when people here, uh, Sierra, everybody asked me like, what the hell, where is that? <laughs> no idea. So I just wanted to show you. So we're here sort of in the middle of the Alps. So this is Zurich. Uh, we have Geneva and this is Milan in Italy. We're sort of in this triangle. And I mean, uh, uh, and uh, this is the view from our offices. So you can see we have a Fantastic. No, but this is the, maybe the most iconic mountain of the region here in Valais, so the Matterhorn. And uh, so we are in, in, in quite a nice environment. Uh, uh, so these are our, our offices here. So when it's not small technology park, but you can also see it's, it's more of a rural area. So uh, I think Sligo, I, I think that's maybe similar in that respect in that uh, it, it is uh, uh, maybe a little bit more remote, but it's a, it's a high quality of life uh, where we have created also our, our research lab. And we have a certain number of research directions. So I put up a, a couple of slides of people working for us here. Um, so from senior researchers to software developers and then PhD students. And I also added one of the, uh, oops, one of the uh, interns here who actually helped in some of the work that led to this. So I did my PhD on content-based retrieval uh, first of all, non-medical images, so more like uh, images from the press and uh, 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 general stock photography. And I started working on multimodal analysis, and this is also part of this talk. So combining uh, different modalities, so context information about images with text, with structured information, with visual information, and possibly in videos, also temporal information or sound. And um, it has gone over to do a much more like machine learning, computer vision, because many of the techniques like deep learning, et cetera, uh, uh, we're working on here in the lab as well. The objective is often really doing decision support, medical decision support. So we work very closely with the hospitals. As I have a position in Geneva and one of my colleagues uh, has a position in Lausanne in the university hospital. So we're very close collaborations. Uh, both on a lot on cancer imaging, radiomics, texture analysis, but also on standardization of images and, uh, and, and these kind of things. And one of the topics that I have worked on a lot over the last uh, 20 years is, are also scientific challenges. So creating data sets, making them available, comparing performance, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we've just published also some guidelines on how to build challenges in the context of the Mikai conference. And then some of the topics like high performance computing are important for what we're doing. I mean, we're not doing really research on it, but it's, it's an important to 
have the knowledge of, of running this. We do like high performance computing. We have some projects on signal analysis, electromyography, et cetera, but that's not necessarily the focus of our research right now. So the project that I um, mentioned to you that I will mainly talk about today, it's called Examote. It's called Extreme Scale Analytics for Via Multimodal Ontology Discovery and Enhancement. So you can see already the topics that I, I mentioned. So working on very large scale, that's why we need also weak labels and not only strong labels because it's impossible to manually annotate it and looking at ontologies and, uh, uh, and making data accessible. So here we want to work on a many images, so very large number of images, but also very big images. Histopathology images are only just becoming digital because they are extremely large. They're up to 100,000 by 100,000 pixels in the standard resolution. Obviously, we can scan them in, in, in even higher resolution. There are several, like if we have a, a prostate patient, for example, you get needle biopsies. You have uh, usually up to 12 biopsies that are taken that are then analyzed that need to be stored. And if we want to develop tools to, to treat this, a, we need to work on strong infrastructures, but we also need to uh, uh, develop tools that are reasonably fast that, uh, that allow to respond to that. And it's, um, it's an EU funded project, uh, which is usually quite competitive. So we have 5 million euro now for four years of work with uh, seven partners. And I'm um, not sure why the slides seem a bit broken. I'll just restart it. Yeah, it looks better. So um, in the consortium, we have a mix of partners. So this is not a fundamental research project, but it's an applied research project. So we have two academic partners. We here in Sierra, we really focus on, on heterogeneous text analysis, normalization, machine learning in that respect. The University of Padova looks into a text analysis, semantics, mapping, uh, the text that we get from our hospital partners uh, onto a semantics so we can actually treat it. So we have two hospital partners. One is the hospital in Catania in Sicily. Um, so reports in Italian and uh, associated images. The other is Radboud University uh, Medical Center in, in, in Nijmegen and, uh, and they have Dutch radiology reports uh, and the associated images. And they will test the tools that we develop we have two industrial partners who will then commercialize the tools that we will develop after the end of the project. Again, onto text more looking into semantics. So the uh, development of ontologies, mapping of text onto ontologies and microscopy IT is more an image processing. So machine learning on, on the imaging data. So they want to market the, the solution. And we have a high performance computing center. So the uh, National Dutch Supercomputing Center, SIFSARA, that is also part of the project to to give us really the, the backbone of, uh, uh, of, uh, of what we're doing uh, in, in this respect. Um, I, mean, I won't talk about the work packages, but we can re really see that uh, there's the fundamental research, the more applied one, Radboud University really makes the link because they have a lot of experience in implementing these tools in clinical practice. And then we have the exploitation on a hospital site and on a more commercial site. And what I will talk about today, um, it's, it's really linked to uh, uh, the, um, this part here. So our work is on, on image analysis, and then we have a work package on text and analysis and semantics, where we do the uh, digital pathology report analysis. So we take data sets that we have available. So in this case, we create data sets in a project. So currently the physicians are extracting from clinical routine data that we can then use. So the data set is growing. Um, we also reuse existing repositories. So there's a large number of uh, data sets that are accessible that we would like to reuse. And one of the things that I will talk about today is also reusing images from the scientific literature uh, to make them available a for training, but also to have them as reference images. And that um, is actually getting possible because uh, PubMed Central, so very large repository of the open access literature, she separates the article text, the images, so we can get these images out in a standardized repository, and it's a, an a exponentially growing repository of many images. But using them, as you will see, is non-trivial because there are many steps of pre-processing, of filtering, of visual analysis be, before we can actually do that. Within the project, uh, uh, we, uh, we have basically four main areas that we decided to work on. So one is colon cancer, because 
uh, there's a lot of screening programs and with the screening programs we can get a large amount of data available so this is important for us uh, as scientists because we have a sufficiently large amount of data but on the other hand also the companies uh, who want to market the tools after the end of the project uh, they want to work on areas where there's a market where tools can actually uh, uh, help clinicians and hospitals to save money on manual analysis. The second one is lung cancer. Again, it's a very frequent cancer, so potential impact is high. Uterus cervix, there's also screening programs, so there's a good amount of data. If we wanted to have one area of histopathology imaging, which uh, uh, is non-cancer, and the clinicians basically propose celiac disease, uh, so uh, like a, a gluten uh, uh, intolerance in this respect or allergy, it's non-cancer, but it's increasingly frequent and it uh, also can have a high impact on the quality of life of people, particularly if it's incorrectly diagnosed uh, and, uh, and, and thus people uh, have like constant uh, uh, pain and, uh, and health problems. And from past projects that we had on the topic, we also reuse uh, prostate cancer images. So this is also something that I will uh, use in some, in some of the examples today because uh, we have data sets available and within the project we're still in the process of creating these data sets. So this is one example of uh, uh, just to give you an idea about the, the image size. So if you look to the to the upper right image, so these are basically three needle biopsies. So somebody puts a needle into your prostate, takes out a very thin uh, amount of tissue. So this is maybe, I don't know, the width of them is maybe a millimeter or two. And um, then these are put with, uh, the, with chemicals to highlight specific uh, parts like the nuclei and uh, the cell tissue in, in, in specific colors. So they are treated chemically, they're cut very thinly, put on a glass slide, and then these glass slides are scanned. And if we took take uh, one um, uh, we take one area here um, and we make it bigger. Here you can start seeing like individual nuclei. And if we take again one part here, make it bigger, we can uh, also see the, the more connective tissue here. So histopathologists actually to analyze the images, they modify the scale depending on what they are looking at. But what we can see here is, I mean, we cannot treat an image of 100,000 by 100,000 pixels just in one go. It will, like particularly for deep learning, it wouldn't fit into the memory of uh, any GPU. Um, these images are up to 10 gigabytes in size, like the basic size. And if we want to do processing of that, up to produce a lot more data than that. So we need to check how uh, how we can deal with these data so we can look at uh, smaller regions but we also need to uh, look at the context of what are the resolutions that we're looking at and what are the structures that we want to see in which resolution there's a very large ver variety in, in in the tissue i mean older people have different uh, tissue than younger people there's differences in the colors depending on how the images are prepared and uh, all of this needs to be taken into account when well, we would when we want to work on on this further so there's again a problem with the slides. I'll just restart this maybe. So we also developed a retrieval system, as I mentioned, content-based ret image retrieval. And here we're looking at patches. And one of the things we have been looking at as well is looking at the resolution. So we're extracting patches at different resolutions. So when somebody looks at a specific query in one resolution that we actually can correspond to that in other resolutions as well. You can then find similar images to this and then you can highlight an image or uh, in this case, a patch of an image. You can modify the contrast to really see like uh, uh, what this corresponds to. Um, so the motivation for looking at the weekly annotated learning, uh, it's really that, well, deep learning has changed over the last five years, the way that we approach our uh, a classification uh, 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 work, the way we uh, approach the, uh, the decision support tools for the clinician, because in some areas, the performance has just gone up very, very quickly. In, and uh, uh, particularly if it's a very well-defined problem and a large amount of data are, are available, then we can get really good performance. But on the other hand, in medicine, in medicine where we don't have these like large amounts of manually annotated data, it's, it's uh, often important to uh, uh, look about alternatives because clinicians are expensive 
So if we want clinicians to annotate the data, this is something that we cannot always do. On the other hand, um, um, we have global labels because for every image that is produced, every histopathology image, a report is written. So a pathologist actually analyzes the images and then describes the most important findings about this image in a report. And this is usually used to take a decision, for example, on the treatment uh, of, of, of these patients, the way uh, that things need to be done. Does it need to be operated? Do we wait before an operation? Do, does the person get maybe operation plus chemotherapy? I mean, that depends on how invasive, for example, a cancer is. And um, but so these global labels we have, so we have a global text, but we need to extract from the text what we would then need to use for, um, uh, for the data. Another problem we have in medical data is that we want diversity because only then we can be sure that uh, actually the algorithms would generalize to new unseen data. That's often a problem if somebody trains an algorithm of one data set, most often it doesn't work on a different data set from a different hospital, and that's problematic. So we want to make sure that um, we're independent of that, and if somebody changes the working procedure or you have a new histopathologist who stains the images slightly differently, that the it doesn't break the tools, but the tools still continue to work. So we want a lot of diversity. So if possible, we want to train with data from a very large number of different hospitals. Um, another problem in medical data is that there's class imbalances. So many cases are extremely rare. So it's similar to, I think, words and text. There's a zip distribution. Oops. Um, um, there's a zip distribution. So uh, a couple of uh, cases are extremely frequent. And then most cases occur extremely rarely. So um, uh, in that respect, we need to look at how can we create more data of the rare cases so they're actually sufficiently represented. So um, when we train uh, a deep neural network, it, it would still get a good performance on the underrepresented classes. So for that, we can either get data from multiple centers or what I will talk about from the medical literature, because this is a by far the most diverse uh, uh, data set that is uh, imaginable. And um, in the last 10, 15 years, many, many resources have become available. So maybe 15 years ago, it was very difficult to get medical data. Now you can get data, but the problem is many of the data sources are not annotated or not, not annotated the way you would like them. But getting raw data is, is really well possible. I mean, there's the medical literature, PubMed Central, you can easily download it. So it's uh, gigabytes of, uh, uh, of images from the literature, but there's no region annotations and uh, very little metadata on the actual images. There's TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and TCIA, the Cancer Imaging Archive. So both the repositories in the US, but where people from the whole world can deposit the data set linked to cancer mainly and, and genomic analysis. Much of it contains images and there are many data sets for histopathology images that we also reuse for our research work. So they are available. Sometimes you need to sign a license agreement, but then you can download them. Most often there's a report attached to it. Sometimes only a scanned report. So you need to use OCR and then do error correction and detect what actually is in there. But there's data available on social networks. There are scientific challenges. I mean, Kaggle makes many data sets available. There's the dream challenges grandchallenge.org, which is from the Mikai community that also makes data sets available. So these are resources that are, that are available and that, uh, that can easily be used. So in, in our project, what we would like to do is to really develop training uh, that profits from weak labels. So we have, for one of these extremely large images of 100,000 by 100,000 pixels, uh, we have one label. So we know what grade of cancer it is, for example. And then we want to make sure that we can actually leverage this information uh, for our, our learning algorithms. And for that, obviously, because we have the reports in several languages, we also need to look at the semantic knowledge that is in the reports and then match that with the images and possibly also removing content that is uh, not 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 relevant for actually the decisions we're taking so background and but also healthy tissue because what we are looking at we want to look at the tumor and some of the histopathology slides for example of needle biopsies of the prostate might not contain any tumor tissue but healthy tissue because uh, they are put in equidistant uh, uh, in an equidistant order and not everything actually touches the tumor so these we can actually move because for grading the tumor uh, that's that's not relevant but that requires uh, additional knowledge so one of the things that we started at the that the university of Padova actually started with is develop a domain ontology for the 
four use cases that we had defined. So based on existing medical terminology, such as UMLS, or Unified Medical Language System, or MESH, the medical subject headings, or MESH exists, for example, in 30 different languages, and uh, maps free text to uh, specific terms. That means that also like synonyms are mapped to the same concept. And in medicine, I mean to say like a heart attack or myocard infarction. I mean, there are plenty of different ways of saying exactly the same thing. So it's important to, when we analyze the text, that we're looking at concepts and not at, uh, not only at, at keywords. And that um, could help us to really um, make things available like at extremely large scales because we can leverage the repositories that are available and combine like uh, repositories of clinical data with images from the literature, for example. This is just an example of the work that the University of Padova did in this case for um, the use cases in, uh, in a project called Examode, looking at uh, diagnosis and possible procedures, anatomical locations that are accessed in, in this terminology. So whenever they now analyze text, in Dutch, in Italian, or text from the medical literature that is mainly in English, they can map it to this ontology, and then we can make sure that actually uh, we're working in, in the same coherent space. And as I had mentioned before, we use uh, the med biomedical literature, and this is the number of articles per year that uh, are available in this resource. And I think what you can see is there's an almost exponential increase and all of these articles contain images, but also the number of images per article has been increasing uh, in, uh, in this respect. So it's also important to look at like what type of images are available. To then make the images actually usable for machine learning or in, like a, um, in a context where we want to do decision support, we developed based on the images that are in the literature, a hierarchy of, uh, of images separating really diagnostic images from general illustrations. We have created tens of thousands of manually annotated images for scientific benchmarks, scientific challenges. Um, and like that, we can actually automatically classify the, um, I think, 14 million images that uh, were available in PubMed Center at the beginning of, uh, of uh, 2020 um, into, into these categories. And then we can look at the images that we're actually interested in. So like histopathology images in, in, in our case, but there's a very large variety. And um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of noise in the images. And another problem is that many of the images in the scientific literature are compound figures. So it's not uh, one uh, image type per image, but there are several images that are combined. And that's linked to some of the journals, particularly in the biology and medicine field that uh, actually only allow two or three figures per article. So people put everything into these two figures, and then we actually need to work on, on cutting these images apart. And just to give you some examples, I mean, I've, I've shown some histopathology images. When you look at it, these, this is what our algorithm said is histopathology. And I mean, looking at it from a distance, you can say, I sort of understand why the algorithm does it. There's even like cell images um, that are hand-drawn. So, I mean, so this is actually a hand-drawn histopathology image, but it's, we have a category of hand-drawn images. So for us, it's not a real histopathology image. But um, what we can see is A, the variety is very like, so they look alike. So we need some manual curation to actually make that work. And manual curation on 40 million images is something that is uh, far from trivial. Another part is compound figures. So this is just one example of histopathology compound figures that we automatically cut apart. For some of them, you have like very clear boundaries separating lines, but there's a lot more that, uh, there are many images that are actually quite, quite difficult and complicated to, to separate. But there's also some metadata that we have available for PubMed Central. So this goes beyond computer vision and image processing, but we, um, we, it, it really helps us to make sense of what we have. So for every figure that we have, we have a caption. So if we have a figure with sub-figures, often we have separate uh, parts for every sub-figure in terms of, uh, of the caption. So this is often very specific, but relatively short. 
Um, and for compound figures, we also need further treatment to actually cut it apart. So it can say something very specific about the image, but very often it doesn't give you the context because the context is given by the article. So we have the full text of the article, which again isn't really specific for figures, but we can check at where the figure is located, where it's referenced in the text. So we can check what is likely in this figure. The article title and the author generated keywords often give us a lot more information about the general context. So if we want to work on prostate biopsies, I mean, very likely an author would put prostate in there if the article is on prostate and um, possibly cancer or uh, uh, something similar as well. Um, and we could use uh, this information then to also uh, constrain further the, uh, the, the data that we would like to reuse. And one of the things that is really good about PubMed Central or about Medline in general, which is uh, maintained by the National Library of Medicine in uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, they actually have coders who take all of the articles, check them manually, and then manually attach keywords on the articles, which allows then this, uh, the search engine for medical uh, literature to uh, actually do like uh, specific uh, constraints on finding, finding systematic reviews, but also looking at the uh, population. So is it adults, is it humans, is it animals? Uh, because that is uh, all manually marked. It's also usually includes the organ uh, 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 that is marked. But unfortunately it's not available, it's a, a, available for about like 80, 90% of the articles, but for some of them it is not available. So we also need to look into how we can do without actually doing that. And that's, I mean, again, where we could use machine learning to actually look at the globally attached mesh terms at the full text, and, uh, and then check how these match. So we can, even for those where we don't have these manually attached uh, keywords, we can try to automatically uh, generate them. Um, so to make the figures accessible, um, we have developed a pipeline. If you're interested in more information on that, I put some of the references of, uh, of our articles at the bottom that describe uh, more in detail how these pipelines work. But we first look at these 14 million images for all of them. We remove those that are really small that have strange aspect ratios because some of them are actually uh, not really figures of the articles but graphics that were introduced by, by the editors and those we remove. Then we automatically use a figure type classification using the image data, the caption data, um, uh, so we can remove non-relevant images, everything that is non-clinical, or if we only want to work on histopathology, then we would also remove all of the uh, uh, other microscopy, electron microscopy images, radiology, dermatology, et cetera. And then in the next step, we detect uh, compound figures and we cut those into their parts, and then we can reclassify them into figure types again, the cut, uh, cut apart compound figures. Something we re realized when working on histopathology images is that in the medical literature, um, most of the tissue is actually animal tissue because much of cancer research is actually on animals. So you let tumors grow in animals, you treat them, and then you cut them apart and, and have that. So, um, and obviously, I mean, we don't want to compare a rat lung with a human lung because it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's quite different tissue. So for that respect, we remove everything that is uh, non-human, and then we can filter out specific organs that are important, and we can then check for diseases or staging grading information for, uh, for this information. So we get data that we could then use for, for the machine learning. Um, I'd already mentioned in the beginning, I mean, the big advantage of using literature images is really that rare images, unusual images, this is generally what is used for articles. So we have case descriptions of strange things um, because nobody would write about a normal case in, uh, in an article. So uh, this means that we actually get critical masses for these rare diseases because everybody tries to uh, describe them because, because they are rare. There's also a, a very large amount of images from different laboratories. They contain different staining scanners. So if we would like to increase generalizability in our learned models, this is really what's help, what helps in this respect. And plus, it's exponentially increasing. So we know uh, that even if we don't find enough information right now, maybe in a year or two, we have a couple more million images that we can uh, then use. 
plus the images get updated. So the latest images that are published, they use the latest equipment so we can make sure that uh, we're not using like irrelevant, uh, uh, irrelevant equipment because in radiology, if a hospital changes their CT scanner, you basically need to retrain the algorithm. That happens every, every five years, five, six years. So it's also something to take into account when uh, looking at medical data analysis. And this is one example uh, of uh, what we did over the last couple of months in the XML project with uh, also one of our interns to really look at the compound figure pipeline. So uh, what I'd mentioned before is, um, so we have a compound figure with a caption. Um, we then split the panels. So that is one deep neural network where we try to identify what are the regions. And then inside each of, uh, uh, in, inside the image, we also try to identify all of the labels that we have. Um, like in this case, A, B, C, D. So this is a very easy example. Same thing for the caption. Not all caption mention this in such an easy and straightforward way. Um, but here we can easily uh, cut them apart. Then we use a merging of these two models where we can then check if there's any incoherence. So if there are two labels in one image, then we maybe need to check whether we're doing a mistake. If we have an A, B, and D, but no C, then we might need to check if uh, there's maybe something that, uh, that we missed out. And then we can uh, have for each panel, we can get the label and like that for each of the labels, we can then get the text. So this is the general pipeline. As I said, these are two different networks and then we do a, a beam search to actually do that. And I mean, these kind of images, the boxes are maybe not always perfect, but uh, it gives a fairly, fairly good idea. What you can also see is that uh, sometimes the labels are uh, quite difficult to see. So here you can see an F and an E and a D but some of them are actually hard to recognize. And uh, uh, obviously by training with more images, we were in the process also of improving the performance and uh, um, it actually works reasonably well. So we have two uh, data sets that we use. So this is taken uh, from an article that is currently under preparation. Um, uh, so we use a data set from, from a, a challenge called Image Clay from 2016. Well, we can see that in terms of the accuracy that we have, we actually increase over all algorithms that we know that are, are currently uh, published. Um, so this is the data set that was made available in 2015 and uh, had been used for, for challenges for, for a couple of years. But there's also a data set of, uh, uh, of a group from the National Library of Medicine of uh, an article of Zoo et al. I can, if anybody interested, I can give the references. And, here we can see that uh, we actually uh, try to really make sure that we work on a high recall. So we have, uh, our precision is not as high, but we have a better recall on the, the panel splitting of this. But what we then really looked into is the label recognition, because that is really important if we want to make the link with the, uh, the, 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 the caption text in, in that respect. And that's something we did. And uh, here we also really associated the caption. This is something that in the literature had not been described before to not only match the captions, the labels, but then also match uh, the text for all of the subfigures. And so this is part one, really looking at how to leverage uh, existing data. And it's something that is ongoing work. So we haven't used uh, the subfigures and figures that we have created for, for the machine learning yet, but that's something that we're in the process of implementing. What we already have used weak and strong labels together is um, uh, in a case of, of Gleason pattern classification and Gleason scoring for prostate cancer. Because we had data sets that, uh, that are available, that are publicly available, so anybody who's interested in getting them, again, I can, I can, I can send you the links for how to download them. So for prostate cancer, uh, uh, there is a scoring system available called Gleason scoring, which basically classifies uh, tissue areas into a score from basically one to five. So one and two, is usually something that is, would be considered as benign, so something where you wouldn't take a biopsy. Starting from when uh, the tissue starts to, to degenerate, that would be a, a Gleason score uh, of, uh, a Gleason pattern of three uh, to five. That's usually what occurs in the cancers that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we have, so where we have histopathology images. So that's a pattern classification. So basically from 
from three to five uh, that occurs. And in Gleason scoring, so for a whole slide, they take the two most prominent patterns and put them together. So if you have a little bit of three and a little bit of four, then you would have a Gleason score of seven. And that's actually what is relevant uh, for treatment. So what determines so Gleason uh, a score basically of seven usually would mean that's when you start operating. If it's only like six, then you wouldn't do operating. At eight, you would definitely do a, a, an operation. So it's treatment relevant information. Um, and so in that respect, quite often when we have the reports, they usually uh, talk about the, the Gleason patterns and the Gleason scores. So that's information that uh, we have for a relatively uh, large amount of, uh, of information. But then we have a global label, for example, a Gleason score of eight for an image of 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. We don't know which area of the image actually corresponds to these parts. And then what we would like to do is really learn from the weak labels, so global labels, and evaluate the performance also on totally unrelated data sets to really show generalizability of, uh, of that. And what we use is uh, data sets of the Cancer Genome Atlas. So here we have global labels. It's whole slide images. It's not needle biopsies, but prostatectomies. So it's, it's prostates that had been surgically removed and then cut. We have from Zurich what's called tissue microarray. So these are more focused areas. And these are labeled manually for on a pixel level. So here we have very precise labels. And then again, there's a scientific challenge called Panda, where we had global labels that were made available. And we, we used several uh, different approaches in that respect. So one of the paradigms that we used is a teacher-student paradigm. So what we started with is we used so uh, a TCJ data set that's weekly supervised to basically train a ResNet-type network uh, uh, in a basic way. We then used the pixel label annotations to fine-tune this network. Then we used the network to actually uh, supervise all of these whole slide images where we don't have any local labels. And then we can take the, uh, the, uh, the, regional, the regional areas with specific labels where we have the highest confidence. And these we can then uh, use uh, to train a lower capacity student model. So in this case, um, it's, a, it's a dense net uh, model that we can then again uh, fine tune with uh, the manual uh, data. And then we can evaluate this model on all of the uh, uh, um, uh, test data that we had made available. So for this um, TMA data set and the whole slide image, we separate the data set into training and validation and then test data. So after we've trained this, we can look at the uh, held out test data and then evaluate the performance and also compare how, how this performs. So what we can actually see is, uh, I mean, this is just to give you an idea about the number of patches that we have created with the, the Gleason patterns and the, the Gleason scores. And what we can then uh, look at is that a fully supervised, so using the pixel level uh, part, reaches uh, a specific performance. But uh, when we use only the pseudo labels, so the, the ones that where well, we didn't have any pixel label annotations, but we used the uh, uh, the the, the uh, the, the teacher network, you can see the performance is not as, uh, as good for uh, the tissue microarrays, but we could see that it's, it's actually pretty good on, on the TCGA. And if we then do the pre-training and fine tuning or with uh, uh, the, uh, the fine tuning with the tissue microarray, we can see that we actually do get uh, uh, a good increase in, in, in performance in this respect. And um, what we can see is that we're, we're getting a better performance than the, the fully supervised parts in, in this respect, both for the Gleason pattern classification, so the scoring from one to five, or the one at the Gleason scoring, which actually combines the two most frequent patterns, where the performance is, uh, uh, is actually increasing further because this seems to be an, an easier task. Actually. And as I mentioned before, we also use data of a data set called Panda data, 
in the same way that we use uh, the TCJ data. So it's, it's very large images. In this case, it's uh, the PANTA data are needle biopsies, so not, not prostatectomies. And um, so we can then use, we have two global label data sets that we can then use for uh, the, the fine tuning. And we can also do that separately. So we can train with the TMA and the TCJ data. So the strong labels and one data set of weak labels and test that model on a completely different data set to see how well things uh, actually perform. What we can see is that uh, um, uh, we can also look at like how much training data we need and how the performance, just, how the performance in increases. Here is uh, the pathologist inter-rater agreement because for some of these data sets we know that uh, there's relatively high interrated disagreement so the uh, actually the, the the highest level that we think we can uh, reach is basically uh, the interrated uh, agreement and with the super fully supervised we can see likely if we had more training data we could still go up a little higher but for the gleason scoring we're actually getting relatively close to um uh, to the interrated disagreement. And this is something when we then uh, do, uh, the, first of all, the, uh, the, the, the weak labels, and then we increase uh, with the, the pixel level labels, we can actually get beyond this uh, 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 Kappa score uh, uh, that, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the supervised and the, and the weakly supervised learning. But as I said, it's, um, what we currently work on is not only using the clinical images with weak labels, but also adding images from the literature to this process to really increase generalization so we can make sure that it works on a completely different uh, data set. But for that, we were currently looking at like uh, matching anatomy, pathology, uh, checking also that we can detect the scale in histopathology images as they are viewed at different scales in different moments. Um, it is um, uh, it is also important that we can actually detect that in the images because in articles people use very different scales depending on basically what they're talking about and then looking at quality control harmonization of the data so oops so we can really uh, make sure that we work uh, on generalization performance um, but also looking at how many images would we need how much how many strong labels, how many weak labels do we need to reach a certain performance? At what moment do things actually try to start plateauing? Because then we would not need to take the additional effort of, uh, uh, of annotating more images. And we're also looking into uh, active learning to really check which are the, uh, uh, the samples that where annotation would help us most. So we're only annotating the regions that we really need for reaching an optimal performance. So I'm reaching the end of my presentation. So I'm reaching also the 40 minute mark, I think that uh, I'm trying to uh, stick to. So currently, current deep learning techniques have much potential in medical image analysis. So the performance for uh, some of these tools has, has been, been really good, um, uh, but they require a lot of training data for reaching good performance really manually annotating images on a pixel level, I mean, for histopathology images is expensive, plus usually the specialists are overloaded. So it's not, it's not even imaginable. I mean, we cannot use simple crowdsourcing because we would actually need, need to find people who are able to identify uh, these cells. And even specialists have a relatively high uh, disagreement. So um, for example, for, for Gleason uh, uh, scoring, that's why we want to work from global labels because they are available. We just need to get them out of the pathology reports to make sure that uh, we have the right labels and uh, we can then check how, how we can implement that to, uh, uh, to, to, to best learn and to leverage all of the knowledge then that we have. And for that, we would like to integrate images from the biomedical literature to really help in the generalization and see how, which influence this can have. Um, as I think, we, I thank the European Commission for their like, Horizon 2020 program for the funding that we have obtained here. Um, if you're interested in more information on our webpage, uh, mapgift.hvs.ch, the, the different projects are described. So maybe not everything is up to date. On the publication server, we usually put the uh, latest publication. So everything that I cited here should be available on our publication server as well. And then on the XML webpage, you can also get news 
from other partners on, on the project. And if there's anything else, you can contact me. Um, I put a group picture because this is a, a many people, some of them have left the group already. There are new people, so I actually need to, need to update that. And I mean, I'm now available for questions and I mean, we're always open also for collaboration. So uh, if you like the mountains, I mean, we're in a fairly nice environment and uh, it's quite a stimulating area, I feel. So don't, don't hesitate to, to contact us and uh, uh, think about ways to collaborate. Henning, thank, thank you very, very much. much. That, that, was, that was absolutely fascinating. And I, I think we'd all take a lot more care with our figures in our papers if we knew how much trouble it was going to cause you. So, uh, yes. <laughs> so we'll try and keep that open. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open the, the, the floor to questions. If you just switch on your microphone, I'll spot that your microphone is on and I'll call on you there. So if anybody has a question, just switch on your microphone there and I'll spot. So I think, um, so I think Vincent, Vincent, sorry, your microphone is on there. Vincent, go ahead. Yeah, Vincent, you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Yeah. On that. Thanks, thanks for the talk, Henning. It was great. Um, so you've mentioned, well, there are a lot of, it's a very difficult task, this classification oh. of histopathology images, and you've mentioned many challenges and different steps. So general to histopathology, the class imbalance, the domain shift, the inter-rater disagreement, and also specific to your, your method, the, the text extra extraction the classification of the literature images, the splitting of the compound figures, et cetera, the weak labels. So with a bit of experience, what, what can you evaluate the errors due to the different steps and what is the most challenging, what do we need to, mo to work most on? I mean, it's, I, I think it's, um, I mean, every step has mistakes. I think in, the, uh, in detecting the figure type, so like, is it a histopathology image on, or not? I think we're reaching something like, 90% accuracy by now. So it's, it's reasonably, it's working reasonably well. And obviously the more training data we have, the better it can work. So it's also, for, for, and for this task, we actually do have a good amount of, uh, of training data available. Um, for the subsequent tasks, I mean, for the uh, compound figure detection, I think it's similar. So I think we're also in the range of 90%. But as it is a very large number of images, even t missing 10% of half of 14 million, I mean, you can, you can make the calculation. So there may be 7 million compound figures. So if we miss 10%, uh, that means 700,000. So that's, that's fairly large. So every time we can actually increase the performance in one step, we would need to rerun the whole pipeline then to check uh, which influence it has on the, on the subsequent steps. Because I think there's a lot more potential um, uh, in, in increasing the performance. And then for the next steps, often it is um, sometimes missing information. I mean, we've worked on um, um, detecting the scale of the images, but again, it's, it's, not, it's not a trivial task. And, uh, um, and I, I don't, I mean, we had two papers on, on scale detection. I'd, I'd need to check the performance. I don't, don't don't know it out of my head. And then everything that comes after it, so really filtering it down to a specific problem, that's really um, a natural language processing problem. So identifying which anatomic region, filtering out humans, but that's very precise because we have the manual labels. And we, I mean, the, uh, the only parts where it's problematic is, uh, um, uh, is where we don't have these labels, but that concerns 10 to 20% of the images only. Um, so in terms of, identifying human tissue, then the anatomic region, I think we're very precise. I think we're at maybe 95% uh, uh, of precision. Again, if you look at the whole pipeline, every time you're losing 5% here, 10% there. So it's a significantly large amount of, uh, uh, of images that, uh, or number of images that we lose. On the other hand, it still gets a, a good amount of images in the end. I think we come up with 250,000 histopathology images now. And among these, um, I mean, if we would like to have Gleason scoring, uh, like a Gleason score of, I don't know, uh, um, uh, seven, maybe we have a few hundred images only that, uh, that we end up with. But this, in addition to the clinical images, can already help us to, to work on generalizability or also in, uh, in looking at the teacher model that, that we can then use to better detect actually regions in in the images that don't have these strong labels. Yeah, 
maybe Thanks. not very precise as a response, but uh, no, it is. It know, is. And for the um, for the scale prediction, I will be talking about this later in the conference. Okay, <laughs> I yeah. will give it, be giving some results too. Have Have you worked on like because uh, uh, we we have created like a small subset where we really generated actually images at different scales based on the the whole slide images, and then we checked how well this performs on such a data set when it was trained with uh, something. But it's it's uh, I mean. I think it's an important problem, and uh, and I think there's uh, uh, there's some potential to to also increase these things. So. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, th thanks, Vincent. If anyone else wants to switch on the microphone, there, I'll call on them. We have a very timid audience here, Henning. Yeah, yeah no, no worries. I mean. <laughs> If you have any any questions, I mean, don't no, hesitate I, 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 to I send an I, email. I think Rory has a question there, uh, Rory. So go ahead. Hi, Henning. Um, just in relation to the data imbalance that you're dealing yep. with, like you mentioned, how the the majority of ailments will be a particular class, but then you have outliers or edge cases. I'm just kind of wondering what kind of data augmentation techniques you're using. Is it generating synthetic data or adversarial networks or what? Like that? I mean. We so far, I mean, what we've been using, I mean, there's a variety of things that we can be using. We, we've been using data augmentation techniques. We're trying to look at the minority class. I mean, you increase the performance, but then you're not generating any like really novel information. The most common uh, uh, way of dealing with it is when you create a cohort that you, you're trying to create a cohort in a multi center way. So you're actually not. Uh, sampling the data based on like you're not taking consecutive cases, but you're oversampling uh, classes where you know that they are rare. Like I mean, very high grades. You you would uh, you would like to oversample in your data so you actually get an idea for those. I mean, in terms of cancer, yes, high grades might not appear that often, but, but fortunately, because I mean that's usually the case where there's little that you can do. So it's mostly the cases at the at the decision border between operation or non where the, the, uh, the increase can be high. We're also working, I mean, in addition to data augmentation techniques that can oversample the class, looking at normalization um, uh, to also reduce the variability that can then also maybe better highlight some of the, the differences between the classes. Okay, perfect. Um, just in, in with regards clinical buy-in to the application of the work, I mean, are the clinicians okay with taking this approach in terms of using their tools for classification? I, I mean, I, I think there's, uh, in general, I mean, in many medical fields, in radiology, histopathology, there's a lack of clinician doing, doing the work. So they have a lot, usually they're working overtime, they're trying to get things done. So they're actually looking for tools because if they do mistakes or if they describe something incorrectly, uh, it has directly a consequence for treatment. So a histopathologist writing something wrong in a report that turns out to be wrong would have a different treatment as a consequence. Same thing for radiology. And quite often you don't get any feedback. I mean, in, in, uh, if you take an MRI of the prostate, you might say, oh, I believe this is, I don't know, uh, it, it should up be operated. But then when you take it out, you cut and you see like, oh no, it's actually a Gleason score of two. So it's something that is not, uh, it doesn't require an operation, but then it's, it's actually too, too late for that. And that feedback is usually not given. So the radiologist might never know that actually what he described in the image was, uh, was not fully correct. Okay. And so in many areas, uh, so talking about acceptance, uh, actually radiologists are, uh, in many, many hospitals, they are looking into how to make the work more, uh, uh, um, more effective so they how can they help to l lose less time in scanning through data that are maybe normal there's also the question of missing uh, some cases that are maybe not very clear or where the region of interest is extremely small i mean if we look at nodules in the lung for example i mean nodules can easily be mistaken with the vessels and but if you miss, miss a nodule and it's maybe a high risk patient who comes regularly for uh, uh, for a control, but it might mean that the tumor actually grows, which makes it much, much harder to treat it. And in that respect, they're actually looking for tools that help them avoid uh, missing uh, this, uh, this part as well. And what they are looking for is 
quite often quantitative measures that help them to make decisions. Well, then what they don't necessarily like very much is uh, a, a tool like a black box that takes a decision where they cannot really reproduce why it reaches that. And one of the things I think there's also a presentation on, on that is interpretability. So it's, it's, it's one of the things that we work in our lab is interpretability of these models to really um, get a better feeling for why a specific decision was taken. What are the, the effects of it? And I mean, the most basic part is just highlighting a region. This is the region that was responsible for a decision. But quite often, that's not really sufficient. So you would need something a lot, uh, um, a lot more detailed and something that is more comprehensive to actually explain a decision. Oh, absolutely. I suppose your multimodal approach is very good for kind of building that workflow. No, fascinating work. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, if anyone else wants to uh, come on the microphone there, I'll, I'll call on you. Henning, I'm, I'm just, I, 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 uh, I've, I've not uh, worked in, in medical before, but I'm, I'm always concerned, or I, I, I also have this assumption that uh, it's very difficult to work in medical because of all the regulation um, and the data protection rights, uh, you know, mm -hmm. ar ar around that. H how, does, how does that work in principle, for example, um, with data that you would be getting from hospitals and so on? At what point do they strip away the, the user uh, or the, the, the patient data from that? Uh, whose responsibility is that? How, do, how does that whole kind of mechanism work? I mean, the, the process is relatively streamlined in general. So there's, first of all, like when there is an, when you have a hypothesis or something that you would like to do research on and you need to acquire data, you need to make, uh, you look at, look at the in, internal review board or like uh, ethics committee. So you write a description of the project, what you would like to do, why you want to do that. They evaluate what is the impact on patients and then they can put specific uh, restrictions on what you're doing. Um, and, uh, and then you can, I mean, if they are okay with it, if the agreement can put like specific uh, things like, I don't know, depending on the kind, if you look at, uh, at uh, an MRI of the head, for example, if it's, it's very thin slices, millimetric uh, slices, and you can reproduce the face. So somebody might be able to recognize the person. So we've been asked to uh, make like small modifications to the face to avoid re-identification in, in that respect. So these are the kind of things. Sometimes you might need informed consent. Sometimes in retrospective studies, like where there's no additional risk to patient, uh, informed consent can be waived, so you can still acquire the data and use it, particularly if you're looking at uh, cases of, I mean, high-grade cancer, people or the majority would most likely be dead. So trying to contact them retrospectively would likely mean that you're contacting relatives and asking relatives to sign and form consent about using the data would put additional stress on them. So it's actually, there's always a sort of a balance of what is the risk and what is the possible benefit of this that, that the ethics committees need to deal with. And then in general, as soon as data comes out of the clinical system, all identifying information is stripped off. So it's depersonalized. And in general, what is usually we talk not about, if it is anonymization, it means it's non-reversible. So remove every possibility to get back to the original patient. What most often is done, it's called pseudonymization. So you actually keep a link. So you give every data item you get out, you, um, you actually give a number and then you have a data set inside the medical institution or sometimes with a trusted third party where you have a link between the actual number of this patient and the original identification of the patient in the, in the hospital system. Um, this is important if you have updates on the patient. So for example, with cancer patients, quite often we would like to know what is their response to treatment. Um, does it work or not? What is their survival time? Mm. Is there recurrence of the cancer or not? So you actually need to update the cases, particularly if you do a prospective study or if not all of the patients, I mean, if all of the patients have died, then possibly you have all of that information, but that's not very likely. So it's, it's something where the, that's why most often pseudonymization is used. That doesn't mean that you can at any moment get back and try to find out like who, who it is. Usually as a researcher, I mean, I don't want to see the personally identifying information myself. I'd rather have it, have somebody else uh, managing that. And most often 
we don't do that. Quite often, the restrictions on what can be done with the data, so often we're not allowed to share it. Um, uh, so you can use it internally with the people of the project who have the authorization from ethics to use it, but you're not allowed to share it. But you can also make a request of sharing it, which then means that additional measures need to be taken so uh, that the, the patient cannot be identified. I mean, if you look at uh, age and gender, I mean, you don't need the exact birth date. So you might have weird birth dates on February 29 or something like that, or in a specific area of the country, you might not have many people who correspond to these criteria. I mean, if you're in a rural zone, uh, that can actually already identify uh, the persons. It's the same thing if you have a 108 year old person, uh, I mean, very likely you can look at the press and find people who, who, who are at that age because there are just not many in the whole country. So in that respect, you quite often what you do is you don't take the birth date, but you normalize like uh, it to 1st of January of the year of when the person was born. So you, or you get age and then often for the extreme cases, uh, like everything above 80, you can put safely to 80 because usually that in most cases that doesn't give you additional information. But having an idea about age in many cases is important because tissue degrades. So if you want to interpret what is in the image, you also need to look at that. Yeah, so it sounds like a, a, a quite a balancing act. And I assume that a lot of pressure comes down on the ethics committee because there isn't really legislation for each of these individual situations. So you just it, have to, you have to make a judgment call really. Exactly. And I mean, there's, it's, it's also, I mean, it's the, the guidelines are, are regularly changed. I mean, there's also things that you realize. I mean, sometimes when we work on that, when we work on radiographs or CTs, but then if you have an implant, an implant it has an identification number. So you yes. can actually get back. I mean, so it's unique. So the idea is that it is unique. So, but that's, I mean, many people have implants. So you also need to check how you can deal with that. There's continuously things that come up where you feel like, oh no, this shouldn't be done in that way. And then it's updated. But it's because there are many people doing medical research. For example, for medical imaging, the medical imaging form at DICOM, they have a certain number of fields that need to be removed from the DICOM header automatically. And that includes, for example, um, there's like DICOM has like public fields that were it's described what is in there. And then the machine manufacturers can have private fields that they can use in their own way. And often that's not described, so it's proprietary information. And usually you remove all that because it turned out that some of the manufacturers actually used birth date in a coded way in some of these fields or the patient identification number, uh, whatever. I mean, they shouldn't, but uh, yes. that, that happens. So all of that information where you don't know what it's about is being removed, for example. I mean, there's a, again, there are practices that are changing and also what is the risk to an individual changes over time. I mean, the more data, the more public data are available. Maybe the risk increases, the more processing power we have, it might mean a different risk. So ethics committees are also evolving in that respect because it's not only the risk to the individual, but it's also the benefit that you can bring to a large number of patients. And if the tools uh, using data for machine learning can really improve diagnosis for many new patients, it's actually non-ethical to use it either. So there's a bit, I mean, there's a lot of debate about uh, the ethics on of, of big data. And we, we created an ethics, um, applied ethics service here in our school as well to actually help us in these aspects as well. So we have an ethicist who really works, I think 80% of this time to consult the different institutes who mainly work on health data, but it's also on, on, on other topics. Yeah, I can imagine that that's important, obviously, because, uh, you know, you're, you're very much dependent on the expertise of the ethics yes. committee and, and, yeah. and, and how much experience they have. Okay, so that's, that's very Also really to understand, I mean, what are they, because sometimes they send us back constraints that we cannot fulfill. And then it's also sometimes just a question, hey, do we really need this? Because here we're not putting any risk, like being able yes. to give them arguments, say like, oh, we don't think that what you judged here is correct, because maybe this was misunderstood or misinterpreted, etc. Okay, very good. Um, so we've, we've time for a few more questions, if anybody has any, uh, otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll move on. So if you just want to come on your microphone there, I'll, uh, I'll call on you. Uh, so I think, uh, Luis, uh, there, you'd like to ask a question? Yes, hi, Professor Sean, how are you? Hi, uh, Dr. Muller. So Lu uh, Luis, you're coming through quite, um, quite distorted there. Is that distorted for you as well, Eva? I can organize. No, sorry, it's just on my side, Luis. Ask your question away. Okay. Okay, so very quick question, actually. I'll be a vessel asking this question because it's not my area, the medical. 
Yep. Uh, it's, you know, on behalf of a group in Brazil, they do micro uh, uh, microfluids yep. uh, uh, exams for, for lung lung cancer. Uh, do you analyze in your, in your work as well uh, microfluids? So the challenge there is a dynamic uh, uh, repository of images. I, I mm -hmm. imagine is, is something part of your work. Actually, n no, I've never worked on on microfluids. Um, we've been trying to look more into like temporal data as well, but it's often not easy to, 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 uh, to, to get such data sets. So um, personally, I have never had a project on, on microfluids, but we've also been looking at uh, temporal data on different, different scales, like for the same patient, for high risk patients, for example, how, uh, how data evolved to really look at like, what is the trajectory of a specific patient, for example. Um, and that would very likely require some, some similar tools to that. But it's, I think it's a really interesting domain, like looking at, at, uh, at really dynamics in images. I mean, there's also histopathology, there's uh, um, uh, fluorescent uh, histopathology. So what the specific things really light up and then go down. The way that uh, they absorb and then uh, show, the, uh, uh, show the colors teaches something about the, the characteristics of the tissue as well. But again, this is something that I've never worked on myself. Thank you so much. That's great. Any last questions there? Just come on the microphone. Okay, Henning, I, th I, th I think you're off the hook. So thank you very much for your talk. Well, it was, it was really, you. really good. Um, I, think, I think you said you, that you're able to hang around for a bit more of the yes. conference. So yes, I'll be uh, around for the, for the conference. Uh, so, so, so that's good. We'll hopefully get more from you uh, today. And uh, obviously we'll, we'll make the recording of Henning's uh, talk available uh, for anybody who needs to go back over it. So um, as I say, we're gonna stick to the same 